I'm Nathan Ponchard, this is Chasing Cars, and this is the 2022 Mercedes-AMG E53 Coupe. Now, the last time we drove the E53 Coupe was at the launch earlier in 2021, and Tom came away saying that he thought it was the best car that Mercedes-Benz makes, which is a big statement, but we're here to see what the E53 is like to drive every day because we've been living with it for a week. Now, other questions that need to be answered are, is that straight six under the bonnet good enough to mean you don't need the twin turbo V8? And is the coupe practical enough to mean that you don't need to have a fuddy-duddy sedan anymore? You can have this slinky pillarless coupe as a replacement. Now, the first thing that strikes me as always with a car like this, although not all the time with the Mercedes-Benz, is that the coupe is beautiful. This, like the several generations of E-Class Coupe before it, is completely pillarless, whereas the CLK that revived this sort of sporting Mercedes two-door flavor in the 90s had frames. So thank God for that. I dropped them right now, but it's raining, so we'll have to use that in B-roll. But you'll see just how beautiful the interior of this is with all of the sides open. It makes having a car like this great. Defining the front is this Panamericana grille. There's been a few styling tweaks in this car for 2021, and I probably should point out that this here silver E53 coupe is stock, meaning that this is as close as you're gonna to get to straight off the showroom floor. Not everything on it is completely standard though. It does have these 20 inch alloys, which are these really cool sort of five spoke alloys, mixed width, 245 front, 275 back there are no cost option i think they look stunning they would be what i would choose because you don't normally see a wheel design like that on one of these e-class bodies sedan or whatever uh, interestingly it has yokohama advan tires which is not what i was expecting but they're good so no brand judgment there we have the turbo formatic badge here which implies that this straight six turbocharged six cylinder does have all-wheel drive and it absolutely does have that when you're driving it we also have black mirror caps, the full black center roof because this has an opening sunroof, not just a glass roof. So you can have all of these windows drop down here except for this little additional pane here, completely open and the sunroof open. So it's kind of like the Cabriolet you're having when you're not having a Cabriolet. One of the other reasons why I reckon the E53 Coupe is so hot is that it looks fantastic at the back end, especially these new slitty lights. They have a very sort of retro look about them, but they also look super modern on this car. When you go into the boot here, which is electric, we have the three chasing cars bags neatly arranged in there, 425 litres of space, which is pretty good. We also have the seat fold things just here, which you can pull to pop the back seat backrest down. And that's more than enough space for a car going on holidays. Large sedans only have about 50 litres more than this in the smaller side of it. So for a two-door, that's excellent. The other great thing about the E53 Coupe is that you feel like you're sitting in a two-door and not a sedan. I don't know what it is that makes it feel so different to the E-Class sedan, but it definitely feels more premium. I love the way you can see those two little humps on the bonnet there, which is a little bit of retroness. Also the gloss back mirrors here, which really stand out, look really nice. I have a sense of sitting underneath the sunroof, which is such a annoying thing about having a sunroof when it sits behind your head. Here you can actually sense that there's a little bit of air going on. And like I mentioned, all these windows drop for that beautiful pillarless view, which just makes the car. The dashboard is as per the 2021 update for the E-Class, which means that it has sort of the latest version of Mercedes-Benz's M-Bucks below what the S-Class has introduced. So we've still got two 12 and a quarter inch screens here. We have a lot of adjustment in terms of the instruments. I've currently got this on Supersport, which looks like something out of Tron 3. If they ever did a Tron 2, this is Tron 3 right in front of me. I've got the uh, Apple CarPlay here, which actually fits in pretty neatly in the car, but does need to be wired through. There is one USB-C port in here, which we have the Mercedes-Benz connected to go to a normal USB. And we've got two more in here for this little carpeted center bin here, which is nice. We also have the Burma Stereo as standard in Australia, which sounds absolutely awesome when the music is something really fresh and well recorded. We also have this new steering wheel, which 
uh, as Tom pointed out earlier on when he drove this car on the launch, it introduces these capacitive buttons on these dual little horizontal spokes. It looks great. They do take a little bit of time to get used to though. My fingers are delicate and beautiful, I'm sure. So they aren't that hard to use, but there is a degree of, um, I suppose, visual cognition that you need to be able to know what things are where and be able to see this white on this glossy black stuff. Sliding your hand on the volume here is not a natural thing. Like you're driving and doing this rather than just pushing a button. Although you can just do this like a normal person and it achieves the same thing. So mm, whatever. The air vents are as per what this car had when it launched in 2017, I think. Uh, they don't quite, in my opinion, match the whole look of the interior, but it's not unattractive either. It does add a level of interest. They've all got a little bit of uh, ambient lighting embedded in them, which you can change the color of. I think it's 64 colors. And having four of them means you can direct them kind of anywhere you want them to go. Open pour wood is also standard in this car, and the general center console is sort of inspired by what the C-Class had in 2014, which has become sort of pretty traditional for a modern Mercedes-Benz. It all works really, really well. It's exposed switches, hear that Volkswagen? Exposed switches that you can use and touch and operate easily while you're driving. And in this little center bit here, you also have the touchpad where you can flick through things on the screen, which you can also do with your hand. And you have buttons around the side for the dampers, the three stage ESC in this car, um, switching to manual mode, the drive modes on this little toggle on the left, and we've got an exhaust button here. So if you program the individual part of this to include the exhaust, then all you've got to do is flick it every time you start because it does default to comfort every time you start up. And just hear that lovely turbo straight six whale burbling away at the back. It's only wailing when it's really hammering, but whatever. These seats in this car are standard, but hardly standard. They have perforated black Napa leather. I would personally choose one of the colored options, but there's enough sort of sparkle in this interior to mean that you're not just relying on the color of the leather to make the interior pretty. They adjust in so many different ways. It's all done on the door like Mercedes-Benz's have for a very long time. But the one thing that does kind of irritate me on a day like today because it's like 99% humidity and that is that the switch for the seat cooling is blank. And I feel like at 173,000 fan cooled seats would be nice, very nice. Speaking of nice is the door itself. It's beautifully trimmed. This is full leather interior. All the dash top and everything is all leather. It's really nicely stitched. It's all an even grain. So it all seems to fit in really beautifully. We've got proper door grab handles here. We've got decent storage in the door. We can sit this lovely nature's electrolyte standing straight up next to the button for the electric tailgate. But I should point out that even though when you open the door like that and the window pops down, oh, and the seat belt comes out for you. And that all works really nicely. These doors themselves are really heavy. So if you live on a really steep street, like my partner does, and need to get out and hold the door out, the hinges aren't strong enough to actually hold a door that's this strong. So you're basically trying to hold it with your feet and hold it with your hands to get out. None of this sort of sitting there and just letting yourself elegantly escape. Although you can elegantly get in the back seat. Here's how a lady gets in the E53 Coupe. You lift this little polished aluminium clasp on the side of the seat, it electronically moves forward. You hold onto here because I've got all the pillarless windows down and look at this stunning view that it offers. Climb through in here, grab the seat back, returns to its own place, which you'd expect for a car that costs as much as this, and just feel the view really like the view in here is sensational at this side with no pillars it's what makes the car i can also see easily out of the sunroof which will open pretty much to about here so you do get a real cabriolet like feel in what is a hard top coupe these seats themselves are essentially just like buckets the backrest is a little bit flat but the base is fully bolstered down the side to really seat you in it nicely the center seat is just cup holders so we've got this sort of plastic little two here and a little piccolo so we've kind of got space for three we do have a pair of air vents here matching the design of the two in the front very high transmission tunnel that doesn't really matter either way there is something here which is another pair of usb ports 
and an ashtray, which is very important in Switzerland. Uh, the centre here, we don't have an armrest, but we do have this sort of faux armrest, which is the ski port that folds down and is actually quite comfortable and has some nice carpet on and a little hinge there, but that's all good. You can chat to your mates in the boot. Um, we also have our own little Burmester speaker grills here, more padded leather along the sides here. All of this is leather. There's another little sort of compartment -y tray thing down the side here. A little space for something there, which I think would probably be a soft pack of cigarettes to match the ashtray in the middle. Either way, this is an excellent four-seater. At five foot ten, I've still got sort of that much-ish amount of headroom. Uh, we've got a pair of top tethers, so we're going to have two baby seats in the back here. This back seat will fold all the way down if I was smart enough to leave it unlatched from when I touched in the boot, but it will go all the way down. So this is a beautiful car, but also a really practical one. The combined fuel consumption figure for the Mercedes AMG E53 is 9.3 litres per 100 kilometres. However, our car averaged 9.6 litres per 100 kilometres. The warranty for Mercedes-Benz is five years or unlimited kilometres. However, it also includes a 12-year rust and corrosion warranty. The servicing is every 12 months or 25,000 kilometres, with the five-year service plan costing $5,100 for this car. Over the last 12 months, the median budget direct customer paid $1,635 to comprehensively insure a Mercedes-Benz E-Class. However, everyone's situation is different and your premium will vary depending on things insurers take into account like where you live, whether you garage your car and your driving history. I think the E53 is a really easy car to like, so I'm gonna start by naming the things that I don't like, because there really isn't that many of them. I suppose the first is that it does have quite a large turning circle, it's 12.3 meters, because this is an all wheel drive vehicle after all, and it does have 20 inch wheels, but 12.3 meters is kind of cumbersome. It also sort of feels like that the steering lock stays on lock when you're on full lock, like it doesn't really, self-center with that much ease. So there must be a lot of that sort of negative scrub radius sort of wheels pointing at weird angles going on at the front with fairly wide tires, of course. But beyond that, there really isn't much to not like. I suppose the three liter turbo straight six does sound a little bit like a rotary when you're hammering it, even though it doesn't rev like a rotary, it definitely has a raspiness to it that you suppose either kind of love or quite like, but uh, the more that you back off and the more that the exhaust crackles, certainly when you're in the sporty modes and with this exhaust button on, which is, let's face it, why wouldn't you unless you were sneaking away from a crime scene or a potential love tryst, then I would leave it on all the time. The engine is really talky. It's maximum 520 newton meters is from 1800 to 5800 RPM flat which is superb. Power is 320 kilowatts at 5.5 to 6,100 RPM. Again, that's plenty. 0 to 100 using launch control is 4.4 seconds. So the E53 ain't hanging about. It is one second slower than the best E63s, but I think that that is purely academic and all about uh, pissing competitions, I think that's how you describe it, rather than actually being something that's really that usable in any country other than say Germany or places that are not speed limited. It does have a little bit of an EQ boost, which is the 16 kilowatt, 250 newton meter, sort of extra little fluffy bit that it adds in that it does for brief periods for an overboost, like when overtaking or when doing full performance figures. But just the general demeanor of this drivetrain with the nine speed, speed shift automatic, just makes the E53 an effortless, relaxing, wafty, talky car to enjoy. Having the 4Matic Plus drive system means that it has fully variable drive split for the all wheel drive, and you can really feel that in tighter corners. The earlier you get on the gas, the more you can feel the drive split going to the rear end, and it kind of has this sort of almost like torque vectoring kind of pivot moment where it sort of gets in and tips in and points its nose where it wants to go, all of which completely belies the fact that this E53 weighs 1950 kilos. It is not a light car, but it doesn't really feel like that much of a heavy car either. The ride of the E53 is mostly pretty good, even in comfort it's still fairly tautly damped. Uh, it does feel quite sporty, so you can have it in individual like I have now with comfort and exhaust in sports and what have you. 
and actually feel like you're still getting the sports car experience. But in sport, even then, it's still not too stiff, which is a nice thing for an AMG. They haven't always been like that. But 20-inch wheels is not a massive hoop these days. That's not a huge wheel. And there's been a couple of moments where the E53 has hit a pothole or a bump, and it has been very rainy in Sydney lately, so there has been quite a lot of opening up of holes in the road, but I haven't been aiming at big holes, and we've hit a couple that I've actually sworn at, would you believe, when I've hit them, because it has let quite a loud bang into the cabin. So I wasn't really expecting that from air body control, the suspension system in this car being air sprung with adaptive dampers. As for the safety systems, this has everything that Mercedes-Benz can throw at it. So really there's nothing that the E53 is missing out on per se that I can see. It's more about how they operate in reality. This is one of the few cars that I've driven that you don't constantly search through the system straight away to try and work out how to turn lane assist and steering assist off because they're so amateur and so annoying. In the E53, it is subtle and relaxed. It kind of keeps an eye on you without nannying you and nudging you constantly. I just feel like this is the benchmark still for what other people should be watching and how manufacturers set up their safety systems and everything else is just not good enough. So. While the E53 isn't a balls out sports car, this is the E53 for Matic Plus, not the E63. So it still has a model to go for that full ball tearing, hardcore, hot rod feel. This is more about being a suave sporting coupe rather than an actual sports car. But the E53 does a pretty good job of blending the both of them. I was surprised at how dynamic this car is when you're driving it on a really twisty, bumpy road. Yet in normal stuff, it's just as wafty as anyone would expect a Mercedes-Benz like this to be. And the steering wheel, for all of its faults with the capacitive buttons, depending on who you are, feels great to hold, is thick where you want it to be, thin where you don't, has really good steering response, and it just makes you feel connected, nice and low, sitting in this car with a great view and looking great. And that's what the E53 is about. Much like every other Mercedes-Benz model that has this new 3.0-litre turbocharged straight-six with mild hybrid electrification, it proves that it's really the only engine you need in a lot of these cars. Much as I love the E63, this E-Class Coupe doesn't need to go that far. 4.4 to 100 is not slow, the engine sounds terrific, the chassis is really agile, and that all drive system with the way it sort of makes the back end pivot into a corner makes this a really fun car to drive. It's also a beautiful car to look at. So I feel like, who cares if you're buying a Mercedes E-Class? It's a coupe and it has its own level of style. It is not a boring sedan, it is very much way more than that. About the only areas that I could really pick on is sort of like the interior isn't probably quite as high tech as it could be and is certainly shamed by the new S-Class but then that costs a lot more money than this and I don't know whether it rides as well as it probably could but for the most part it's such a good car to drive that it's kind of really hard to pick on really. I wouldn't buy silver but let us know what you think in the comments below. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so. And please leave a comment on what you think on the E53 Coupe or on Chasing Cars. Thanks for watching.